the movie preview critic, informing and entertaining your movie world. The opinions and views expressed in this commentary are solely of a fan of good movies and not those of any corporate parents, affiliates, or subsidiary companies currently making shitty movies. The following audio commentary has been reviewed for all audiences by the moviepreviewcritic.com. This audio commentary has been rated NB. No bullshit. Content saves time, money, and prevents emotional distress for audiences. It contains common sense, bad words, and good intentions. What's up, good movie lovers? This is the movie preview critic here, and welcome to Movie Night. Today we're going to be watching Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. So go ahead and put your DVD in the player, or if you have it in, just uh, go ahead and let it get to the menu screen. Thankfully, this DVD gets right to it. You just have the Paramount uh, DVD sort of logo come up, and then it just goes right to the menu screen. So thankfully, no annoying distractions and previews of other movies um, to keep us from the good stuff. So as soon as this animated menu starts, go ahead and hit play, and we'll get things underway. So first time I saw this, I kind of thought Pixar right away. It looks like a great animation, some sort of plant kind of story maybe, little thing going on. But as we're going to see, it turns out it is the new THX sound test. Um, so we're all used to the uh, straightforward, Aum, but this is a little more creative a little more in-depth and detailed. You kind of wonder where it's going until, boom, right here it pulls out and we have that familiar sound. THX quality stereo surround sound. Up next, we find out that Crystal Skull is rated PG-13. That's a newer rating over the last 20 years or so. Back almost 30 years ago when Raiders came out, it had a PG rating because there was no middle ground between PG and R. So when you look at Raiders, it definitely has more blood and more violence. Um, so don't let that lighter rating be deceptive. And then the Lucasfilm logo comes up. I know for myself, every time I see that, I think Star Wars. So they've done a great job of branding that and marketing that. Next up, the Paramount logo with the mountain. And it's traditional for all Indiana Jones films to transition from the mountain of Paramount into some kind of mountain within the story. Here we have a little dirt hill created by a Caddyshack gopher. Right away we're taken into the current time of where the story is set with the 1950s hot rod and the Elvis music. This story takes place in 1957, so that's 19 years after the Last Crusade, which took place in 1938, before the outbreak of World War II, and before the world was basically split up into East and West, into democracy and capitalism versus communism. Now, I don't know about you, but watching this in the theater, the first thing on my mind was, okay, where is Indy? How long is it going to take for him to get on screen? After all, he's really the reason we're all here. In the theater, I was watching this thinking, okay, what does this have to do with anything? In a lot of ways, this might just be George Lucas kind of calling back to the film which really kind of broke open his career, American Graffiti, which was all about cruising cars and listening to 50s music. In the end, I guess it does bother me a little bit that it takes about five minutes for Indiana Jones to make an appearance. If you look at Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade, he's in there pretty much from shot number one. In Temple of Doom, you have the opening on a little musical number, but as soon as that's over, the action starts and he's there. In a lot of ways, the Indiana Jones movies have the same opening structure as the James Bond films, where you see the hero or the main character at the end of a previous mission. In the James Bond films, he's always able to complete his objective, and then 
the credits hit, and after that, the new story starts, the story that we're going to watch. What's great about the Indiana Jones films is that usually he doesn't get what he needs. In Raiders, Belloc one-ups him, and in Last Crusade, the guy who inspires his Indiana Jones look gets the cross back. So what's great about Indiana Jones is he's not a perfect, unbeatable superhero. He's just an everyday, ordinary kind of guy that likes to go adventuring, and he gets his ass kicked a lot. He's always bruised and bloody. This really kind of separates him from the cliche sort of James Bond, and more recently the Indiana Jones ripoff characters from The Mummy and National Treasure. Those guys never seem to get hurt or take any damage. So Indy's not afraid to get involved, get bruised, and feel the pain. Now right here, this is a classic Spielberg type of shot. The guy kneels down, and right behind are the four comrades with machine guns taking out the U.S. soldiers. Just a nice little way to reveal the enemy from behind. So it's classic Spielberg shooting right there. Now still, kind of wondering, okay, where is Indiana Jones? We got the restricted area sign right here. And where is our hero at? What's unfolding? But that's that's fine, because it keeps us interested. Okay, what's this whole mission sort of thing about? What's What's going on here? Not necessarily a bad thing. But I think for me, just in general, I kind of like my Indiana Jones movies to start with Indiana Jones. And speaking of, right here we're going to cut to the introduction of our hero. They go into the trunk and pull out his associate and then reveal the man we've been waiting for. But it does take about five minutes for this to happen. Gotta love the way it happens, though. This great overhead shot of pulling some mysterious person out of the trunk. Another great shot here of the hat on the ground. And he walks over to pick it up. Coming up here is just another classic Spielberg shot where when he puts it on his head, we have the shadow up against the truck. There is the recognizable, iconic image of Indiana Jones, which is what Spielberg is a master of doing, of framing shots and creating these memorable movie images in our minds that are forever stuck there. Whether it's the dinosaur chasing after the car with the rearview mirror, or the water rippling in Jurassic Park, or if it's E.T. and Elliot in the bicycle over the moon. He's the unparalleled Rembrandt of painting with the movie camera. However, a director as great as Spielberg can't change the material that's on the page, so his name isn't on the screenplay, and there are definitely some issues with the structure, so we'll get into those kind of as we go through the film, but right here we have an important moment because we're going to be introduced to Indiana Jones's main opposition, which will be constantly fighting him throughout the rest of the movie. This guy is more of a uh, minion, if you will. The main bad guy is going to be Irina Spalco, played by Kate Blanchett. But I want to point out one quick thing right here. Look at the background and just this scene. It seems a little bit too hyper-real. This scene here where Kate Blanchett's getting out of the car and we have the sky in the background... It really looks like they're on a set or something with a green screen, blue screen. Very reminiscent of like a 300, where it just feels a little too hyper-real. And that's something that just doesn't fit into the whole Indiana Jones sensibility. The first three movies were all made in the 80s, before CGI effects changed the way movies were made forever. If you really look at it, it was in 1988 with Willow and The Abyss, um, each of those movies kind of had little segments where CGI was used. In Willow, it was changing um, a person into a rodent or an animal and then back into a person. And then in the abyss, there was kind of the liquid water creatures. Um, so James Cameron and George Lucas really started that, and then Cameron really perfected it with 1991's Terminator 2 with the T-1000, which, of course, we all remember and know and love. So from that point on, movies were never the same, especially after Jurassic Park really upped the ante in terms of CGI. And that was in 1993. So Last Crusade was in 89, sort of maybe one of the last big-budget sort of films to rely on old-fashioned stunts and go on location, which really made the adventure feel real. When they were in the jungle, you were sweating. You can kind of feel the heat and the humidity. And then when they're in the desert battling, you can feel the dust kicking up and feel the heat from the sun. 
So one major change for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is that whole aspect that now CGI is involved, and you can tell they're on stages and there's a little bit of green screen involved and special effects. So it just automatically has this different kind of tone. So here we have another great Spielbergian shot of the inside of Area 51 of this hangar, and it's just another classic image. It really just complements the end of Raiders when the arc is put in there and there's the big pan kind of pull out and we see how big and vast this this warehouse is. I did want to bring up just the notion of the opposition, the opponent in any kind of movie. Just in general, the level to which we really root for a hero or a main character is tied into how strong the opponent is, into how much we think this opponent actually has a chance of beating the main character. Here there's yet again another awesomely framed Spielbergian shot of the opponent Irina with her saber kind of cutting her face in half right here. She points it at Indy's throat. But does that make her menacing? Does that make her fearful to the main character? Do we think, okay, she's really going to take out Indiana Jones? Uh, kind of not really. I mean, it looks cool, but I don't know if it's the strongest sort of opponent that we could have asked for for this film. One little thing maybe that could have been added is there was that little moment earlier where she kind of tried to read Indiana Jones' mind, and she's been established as someone who's working for this sort of x file ESP, Psy, abnormal kind of research weapons division. So why not take another step up? Why not give her a little bit of some sort of psychic ability telekinesis or something. Um, It might make it kind of cartoony, but something that would just elevate her a little bit more. It would also help to eliminate some of these story inconsistencies that happen later on when the communists just kind of happen to pop up in the right places at the right times, and we never are fully told how they knew where to be where at that certain moment. Since this movie's dealing with this paranormal sort of angle to the story, why not just go a little bit further and give Irina some kind of power, some kind of ability that puts her a little bit above Indiana Jones? Again, in the movies that we remember, the opponent is usually always stronger at the beginning of the film than the main character. If you look at Star Wars, Darth Vader is more powerful than Luke. The Matrix, Agent Smith is definitely stronger than Neo. If you're looking at Lord of the Rings, Sauron is stronger than everybody. In The Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch is more powerful than Dorothy. In Braveheart, Edward the Longshanks is way stronger than William Wallace. And these opponents are really sort of the mountain that the main character has to climb and conquer in order to become the person they're going to become, in order to achieve their destiny and grab hold of their own power. The opponent is the challenge the main character needs to fulfill their potential. So while having Arena possess some sort of psychic ability or maybe even telekinetic powers to a limited extent might seem a little bit absurd, I don't know if it's any crazier than this scene right here where they're just going to pull out this tomb box with an alien in it that's magnetizing everything. And just to comment on the sequence that we've just watched, I really like Indy's ingenuity here when he realized that the box is super magnetized and all you need is just some sort of magnetic dust and it'll basically act like a trail of breadcrumbs that lead you to your destination and pay attention to this moment here this box is really magnetic and you're gonna see that it's gonna be dragging like these cups and there it pulls the lights towards it but one question I have is the guards that are carrying the box they have guns on them and for some reason these guns aren't swinging over and just latching onto it Now, I don't know if Russian guns in the 50s were made from some sort of granite material or something that's not magnetized, but just a little thing. I mean, I'm sure the filmmakers thought of it because everything else is being attracted to the magnets, but that's just some sort of little logic part of my brain that I was always on no matter what kind of movie I'm watching. So if it becomes annoying, just let me know in the comments section and I'll turn it off for future movie nights. Gotta love the glasses being magnetized to the lid. That's an image we all remember from the trailer, because it said Area 51 on it. 
Here we have the big reveal. This is always a big challenge in any kind of film where, because of the internet, because of word of mouth, we all pretty much know what's going to be revealed. So the challenge to the filmmakers is to think of something that's going to be worthy of our expectations and is even going to be above that, so we're a little bit surprised. I like kind of this rubber sort of cocoon that the alien's in and cutting it open and the smoke coming out is just a classic sort of image. It's a little bit cliche even, but it's unique enough that it, it strives beyond what we've already seen. Great shot of Indiana Jones there. Now he's kind of looking at the guard, thinking of how he's going to get out of this. I like this shot here with the soldiers holding the lights, and the lights are just pulling towards the uh, coffin. So another good job there. And then Indiana Jones springs into action right here. This is awesome, of course. And we've gone about 14 minutes into the film without a real action sequence. So now it's time to get things moving. In a second, we'll have the revelation that Indy's friend Mac is a traitor and is actually working with the Russians. I sort of wish Mac ended up having a little more of a deeper sort of motivation for betrayal and becoming a traitor to his country than just money. It seems just like such a tired, tired reason for someone to betray a friend or betray a country, but I guess it never gets old. People always want money. Now this moment here gets a little bit goofy where Indy drops the gun and shoots the soldier in the foot and that kind of enables him to run away and start his escape. But Indiana Jones has never really been totally serious. All the movies have a strong element of comedy. Even Temple of Doom, which is regarded as just like this bleak, super dark movie, has a lot of comedy in it. And The Last Crusade probably should be regarded as one of the best comedies of all time. So that movie is just totally hilarious. But again, that's because of Sean Connery and the father and son dynamic, something that's missing here. And just remind me to bring that up in just a little bit when Shia LaBeouf comes into the picture, because Sean Connery was able to take a character and really make it something special and memorable and unique. And it, the dynamic between Connery and Ford with Indy and his dad really just created that super memorable relationship. Whereas here you have the father and son and uh, the chemistry really isn't there. Here we just have this action sequence. It's pretty amazing. And Indy just swung back into a truck, breaking the metal frame and the glass. Now, again, you kind of have to suspend your disbelief right there because as strong as he is, that's going to hurt. And probably he wouldn't end up breaking it. And notice any time that there's some sort of glass breaking on a truck, how perfectly cut it is. You know, it's just a little bit too fake, but... Ah, uh, there we have a little callback to Raiders with the Ark, the broken box, and I know that's a moment that got a good round of applause in theaters. Gotta give the original some respect. Here we have a nice old-fashioned stunt with the trucks kind of crashing into each other, and a little hyper-reel with Indy swinging on a, a lamp and going up to this wood sort of structure and running along the beams perfectly, not falling, in balance. We'll buy it. I mean, it's fun. It's Indiana Jones. This is just about as believable as the famous Temple of Doom carts in the mineshaft race. Here the action sequence continues with the fighting of the henchmen and Indy. And this is one of my favorite parts where he kicks him off the plank, jumps on the rope, and then swings back and kicks him through the glass. Very matrixy, a little bit, little bit unbelievable, but it's really fun. And it sets off the test rocket that they're going to have a ride on in just a second, so... It's all for a good reason. Since the action is taking place inside of Area 51 in the 50s, you got to take advantage of what technology would have been around at that time and kind of showcase it. So it's nice that we're going to see a nuclear blast and we see some of this secret technology. And here's Indiana Jones getting his ass kicked again. He always is always getting beat up. Here we have some CGI effects right here with the flame burning all these soldiers. And Mac, just in time, goes behind the stone wall and to safety. This rocket ride is definitely very cool, a little bit funny. And you can just tell that the filmmakers are really trying to up the ante in terms of what's been done in Indiana Jones films in the past. Again, they have to compete with the last 19 years of movies that have tried to take over the place of Indiana Jones. 
So you have all the Mummy movies, you have the National Treasure films, even the Da Vinci Code, which is another example of a main character you don't really remember the name of, where the objective is more memorable than the people in it. So you have all these adventure movies from the past 19 years that have tried to one-up the first three Indiana Jones films, and now Indiana Jones comes back, and he has to now one-up all of those films. Or at least that's what the filmmakers think they have to do. In reality, we want Indiana Jones instead of all these wannabes. What these other films have failed to do is give us a replacement for Indy. They've won up the opponents and the set pieces and the special effects. Those are all amazing. But they haven't connected us to an adventurer the same way that these indie movies have done. And unfortunately, it seems like Crystal Skull has gotten wrapped up into that recent philosophy of just making it bigger and bigger and bigger. So by the end, there's this fantastic sort of alien ship, interdimensional special effects extravaganza, which is great. I mean, it's totally, totally eye-popping and jaw-dropping. But after everything calms down, we realize we haven't really connected with Indy the same way we did in the previous three films. Okay, let's take a moment to focus on what's going on in the movie right now, because we have the infamous nuke the fridge scene coming up in just a few moments here. This is really great. I like this whole idea about Indy finding sort of a nuclear test town. We've all seen the old black and white footage of these towns being demolished by a nuclear blast. So it's really cool to see it in color and have, of all people, Indiana Jones roaming through it. The term nuke the fridge has become synonymous with jump the shark. Jump the shark tends to exclusively be only for TV shows, so nuke the fridge now refers to movie franchises and the moment they take a nosedive in terms of quality. And this nuking of the fridge is definitely the moment when disbelief and ridiculousness enter the Indiana Jones franchise. In the first three movies, there was always a sense of silliness, and it kind of increased with each installment, really culminating in The Last Crusade. So while The Last Crusade was definitely the funniest of the first three movies, and the silliest, it was still believable. Here, with this nuke the fridge moment, it's just an unfortunate sign of what's yet to come. And we'll talk about it later, but just to bring it up now, that scene where Mutt Williams is swinging with monkeys in the vines in the jungle, reminiscent of Tarzan, it's just, you got to roll your eyes and just say, what happened? You know, what were they thinking? So here Indy's going to open the fridge, and there's going to be a close-up of the note that says the fridge is lined with lead, as if that's going to be enough for us to believe that he could survive it. Now, there's not even a latch or anything on that fridge, so how does it stay closed the whole time? Is he just kind of holding it? If he's holding it shut, he definitely has a lot of strength, because we're going to see the fridge flying in midair in just a couple seconds. It's going to pass up the car with the Russian soldiers as they get nuked, and then the fridge is going to constantly hit the ground, and let's see if it opens. Nope, 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 it's probably traveling like a couple hundred miles an hour, and it's not opening yet, nope, 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 and it comes to a stop, and just like five seconds later, the door opens. Okay, let's not get into how hot the thing would be after going through a nuclear blast, and that's kind of a little bit too perfectly cute where the gopher is at the mountain. And then this here. Now, again, the image looks really cool. Indiana Jones standing with a mushroom cloud in the distance. This is totally a great shot, but it does not belong in this movie. It really makes you roll your eyes, and from that moment on, you're just like, okay, what is going to be going on the rest of this movie? We're about 22 minutes into it, and there's about an hour and 40 to go, so you kind of have to be worried. With this interrogation scene coming up, let's talk about why this movie really doesn't feel like a solid part of the trilogy. It really does deal with Indiana Jones as a character. 
in the first three films, he's always really excited and really involved with the objective he's going after. And if anyone's confronting him or challenging him, he just answers back with passion and determination. Here, when these FBI agents are interrogating him, he doesn't answer them with that usual indie fire. Now, it's going to be revealed that he was actually at Roswell in 1947 when the reported UFO crash happened. Why isn't this affecting his character in any kind of way? This should really tie into the backstory of Indy. You know, what's happened over the last 19 years since we last saw him? Maybe he believed a little bit more in religion after Raiders of the Lost Ark and his experience there, and especially with his experience with the Holy Grail. But after seeing aliens, maybe it kind of shook him up a little bit. Maybe he started to doubt or think he was a little bit crazy, and then the government wouldn't tell him all this information that he wanted to know. Maybe he tried to go on some missions on his own and find out the truth, but they led to nothing. After that, he decided to put it out of his mind, and now this is bringing him back into the fold. He was just in the warehouse with the Russians after they opened up the little casing with the alien in it, so it might have brought up all these feelings and thoughts and beliefs that he's been repressing for the last ten years. What's missing here for Indiana Jones is the fire in his eye. In those other movies, he really wanted to go on the missions. He really felt passionate about it. Here, he's kind of just a disgruntled, sort of old man who doesn't care or just doesn't want to be bothered. Even his father, in The Last Crusade, when he talked about the Grail, when he talked about going on the journey and finding it, he was really alive, really energetic. You know, We knew that this meant something to him. It would have been great if this mission, if this whole story would have affected Indiana Jones on that emotional, thematic level. But it didn't, and that's really the core of what's missing in this movie. In a second, the action's going to switch over to the university, and Indy's going to be back in a familiar place teaching. What's also missing here are three major characters from the previous films. First, we have, of course, Delholm Elliott who played Marcus in the other films, he unfortunately, after the Last Crusade, died in the early 90s of complications due to AIDS. So it's definitely unfortunate and tragic and sad. But the two other actors that are missing, one would be Sean Connery as Indiana Jones's father. He's alive and well, but in retirement. And I guess he's enjoying that because he's in his 70s and... They made the call for Indy 4, and he turned it down. So if Sean Connery won't go back to movies to make Indy 4, you can pretty much guarantee he won't be making any other movies, which I guess we can be kind of happy that he won't be making The Rock Part 2. I'm only half-joking. For all you The Rock fans out there, I really do enjoy that movie. It's a fun little action summer film. But the other major character that we all know and love from the other Indiana Jones movies is Sala played by John Reese davies who is definitely alive and well, so you got to kind of wonder why he wasn't brought back, at least for a cameo appearance. It could have been very fun for the audience just to see him in a scene here or there. Or just acknowledge, maybe he's also dead. It has been 19 years since the last adventure, so maybe three of the major characters have met their demise. This might be a good moment to bring up the cinematography. Uh, right now, it's Janusz Kaminski working behind the camera, someone that's been with Spielberg since Schindler's List in 1993. But the man responsible for the first three Indiana Jones movies is Douglas Slocum, with a B-E at the end, so I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right. He's actually still alive, but into his 90s, which means he was in his 70s when he made Last Crusade. He's most famous for kind of having this movie urban legend about him, where, as the story goes, he didn't use a light meter during the filming of Raiders of the Lost Ark. So a light meter, for all you non-filmmakers out there, is just a device that just measures the light in any scene or setting. And in general, when you're filming something, you usually do it from multiple angles, and you want to make sure that the light is consistent no matter where you are. So you want to use a light meter to kind of just keep the measurements the same. So Douglas was so good that he could just do it with his eyes. It's pretty amazing. Janusz Kaminski studied the first three films and basically tried to mimic Slocum's style for those films here. 
Now, the thing that I've noticed, and it kind of bothers me a little bit in this movie, is no matter where the characters are, no matter what the setting is, whether it's in a house or in the coffee shop or even on the motorcycle, there always seems to be this sort of like light coming from above, just glowing on the character's head and shoulders. I don't know what the purpose of that is. It might be because we're in the 50s and there was this paranoia with the communism and the Red Scare and everyone was a suspect and it's sort of reminiscent of being interrogated. That could possibly be it. But it's another little factor that you just kind of pick up on and it just makes you feel that it's not the same kind of Indiana Jones film. Just to keep the commentary in sync with the movie, I'm watching the moment at the train station where Mutt Williams appears for the first time. Now just to speak about his style and the character, the look is definitely influenced by Marlon Brando in the movie The Wild One. That movie and that image has come to represent the iconic 1950s greaser. This moment here is really important in terms of the story because it's someone else pulling Indiana into the adventure, almost forcing him to go for it. Where before, if something like this FBI interrogation had happened to Indiana, he would be the one that would want to try to find something out, would want to clear his name or discover the truth about it. It's just a little subconscious thing that goes on here where we remember watching those first three movies and he's the one that's determined to get things. Here, he's really being forced to kind of go into the adventure. Here we have the first time that Mutt and Indy sit down and have a conversation. There's a lot of potential levels that could be going on here with each character. First for Mutt, this is obviously the first time we're having a chance to meet him and find out who he is and what he's about. So it's important that he convey his movie objective. Again, each character should want something within the film. I do like that little moment right there where he reached into that other guy's drink to wet his comb and grease his hair. So that was a nice character revelation. But beyond that, there's really nothing totally interesting about Mutt as a character. To go back to the point that was started earlier, Sean Connery really created a nice father figure character that played off well with Harrison Ford and the Indiana Jones character. Here, Shia LaBeouf needed to create a totally complete original character. What happens instead is that Shia LaBeouf plays Shia LaBeouf. If you watch his last four movies, which would be Eagle Eye, Indiana Jones, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Disturbia, and Transformers, he's pretty much the same person in each film. And that means that at the moment, Shia LaBeouf is a star and not an actor. The difference being, a star is just a personality, a celebrity that we all know and pretty much like, and we want to see them and their established public persona in movies, or whatever form of entertainment they're used for. If you look at the career of a star, the characters they play over the course of many movies tend to just be themselves. If you look at an actor's career, each movie they're in is really an exploration of a unique individual. They're getting under the skin of a persona and totally disappearing behind that. Another example of a star would be Nicolas Cage. Look at his last three films, and it's pretty much Nicolas Cage as Ghost Rider, or as Mr. Next, or as The Wicker Man. A great example of an actor would be Gary Oldman. He was in The Dark Knight playing Commissioner Gordon, but if you look at his films over the course of his career, every single one is an example of Gary Oldman almost becoming possessed by some sort of new personality. Whether he's playing Sid Vicious and Sid and Nancy, or he's playing Oswald in JFK, and again, most recently, Commissioner Gordon in The Dark Knight. All three characters are really distinctive and have unique traits about them. When you look at Shia LaBeouf here, and in his previous films, he's pretty much doing the same thing in every movie, except he's dressed differently, and there's a different environment around him. The biggest giveaway of this lack of getting into a new, unique character is that his characters always say, no, 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 like a million times. Each character, each personality is basically like a music note. They should all sound different. So while the character of Mutt dresses differently and makes Shia LaBeouf look a little bit unique, he's basically the same sort of person. Making Shia, in the end, a star and not an actor. So if Shia wants to do some acting, he should probably do some kind of independent film that challenges his range. In this hamburger joint scene, there's been a couple key moments that have just passed by. Indy did not recognize the name of Marion. 
which in terms of the story and the character development is really a missed opportunity because again if you want to develop indiana jones's character his emotions and his theme he should be someone who is grappling with getting older not having a family never having been married and maybe he does think about these past loves of his life so why not have a nice close-up of his emotional reaction when he hears the name marion Maybe he wishes that things had gone differently, that he was a little bit wiser back then and hadn't made the mistakes that have led him to a lonely life at this moment. The second key element is that Indy talks about the legend of the Crystal Skull, and at the same time learns that his old mentor and friend, Ox, has gone missing. Add to this the death of Marcus and his father, and that Indy was in Roswell in 1947, and this is all coming back at this moment, and the emotional insides of Indiana Jones should be bubbling up like a volcano ready to explode. It's been about 10 minutes since the last action sequence ended, so here we go with another one, the hamburger joint greasers versus Archie's preppies fight. And it was started because the Russian agent showed up wanting the letter that Mutt has. Just to ask a question regarding the story, why did Arena want to kill Indy at the Area 51 warehouse when she said, say your last goodbye? But now it seems like it was part of the plan to let Indy go so that Mutt would show up with this letter that they needed. Seems more like the hands of the screenwriters are controlling the character's motivations than logical event and decision conflict. Also, the whole stealing of the alien body from Area 51 never comes back into play. So what was the point of all that regarding the story structure? First, you get Mac revealed as a traitor. Then the Russians and Irina are introduced as the opposition. But none of it seems to create the decision for Mutt to take a note and visit Indiana. That seems like it's an off-screen thing that happens somewhere else. Basically, it seems like the warehouse sequence was an excuse to see where the Ark was hidden from Raiders of the Lost Ark, and then have some pretty great fight sequences and chases, ending with a nuclear explosion. And speaking of a great chase, here we're in the middle of the motorcycle and car sequence, which is really a callback to The Last Crusade, when you have Indiana and his father on the motorcycle with the side buggy. This chase here is pretty ambitious. As you can see, it's pretty much all real stunt work. It doesn't seem like there's any CGI taking place. But there's a difference between this sequence and the one from Crusade. The one in Crusade seems to be a little more fun. And the reason for that is Sean Connery. His character, the character of the father, is really alive, and he has this unique kind of perspective, and he's doing these goofy things with the cane and hitting the German soldier, and even backseat driving, or in that case, side seat driving. Here, there's no interaction between Indiana and Mutt Williams. It just feels like you're watching a car chase a motorcycle. What would make it stand out and be unique and a little more engaging is if the characters were battling with each other as this intense chase is going on. Sort of, in Last Crusade, Indy and his dad were almost bickering with each other. It could be said that, while well, those characters had a history, it's father and son, so the writers and the filmmakers and the actors kind of worked on a backstory for each of them, and when they meet, they have this 40-year history between them. There's a subconscious, subtextual dynamic that the son is always trying to prove himself to the father. So while Mutt and Indy have just met, there's no excuse as to why their characters shouldn't be a little more engaged with each other in this sequence. One really easy suggestion would be just mimic the same sort of situation from Crusade, where now Ford is in the Connery role and Shia is in the Ford role, so that you have Indy as kind of the older man who's maybe a little bit scared of the reckless driving and making all these backseat suggestions, and now you have Mutt who's taking charge, which would actually fit nicely because reportedly Lucas wants to continue the Indiana Jones story but using Shia as the new adventurer and retiring Ford. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but right now we're inside the library and they're driving on the motorcycle, and we're going to have this slide along the floor under the tables, and this just seems a little bit too extreme. Seems like they had the wires pulling them, and then they were later taken out in post-production. And here we have a nice kind of comedic button to the end of this scene where Indiana's student is sitting on the chair asking him a question, kind of oblivious to the action and ridiculousness of having a motorcycle in the library. So while this has been a really engaging and fun five minute or so action sequence, you don't really feel anything's been added between the relationship of Mutt and Indy or on a thematic emotion level for either of the characters. And that failure is really created in the hamburger joint where their conversation about Marion and Ox and the Crystal Skull 
really doesn't unveil or dig deep into each of the characters revealing their struggles or their secret desires or their objectives for the film and their inner fears. Here's another example where the cinematography has that lighting from above where there's the light on the shoulders and on the heads. Again, it could represent the paranoia interrogation of the 50s. It might kind of also allude to the an alien ship. After all, Close Encounters is a Spielberg film, and that's very famous for kind of having the light come from above, especially in that scene where Richard Dreyfuss is in his truck and the light just surrounds it. So maybe there's a little bit of a hinting at that with the cinematography and the entire lighting scheme. Here, Indiana seems to come back to life as he decodes Ox's secret message. He maybe accomplishes the translation a little quickly, but we'll accept it. After all, it's Indy, he's a professor, he's super smart. The Mutt Williams character in the scene is pretty quiet and really has nothing to do. And again, that's from a lack of depth to the character. And that probably goes back to the screenwriting and just the preparation for creating a complete character. The most in-depth characters are kind of like icebergs, where as we're watching them on the screen, we're just seeing the tip that's above the water. And below the water, there's just this huge landmass's depth of almost infinite memories and desires and inner conflicts. So far here, nobody really has anything like that going on. In any given scene, there's really two threads that should be constantly moving forward. On the one hand, you have the objective, which ties up with the opponent, the battle for whatever you're going after. And on the second level, you have the theme, which deals with the characters and their emotions, and how the pursuit of the objective and fighting with an opponent changes them and challenges them. This should definitely be applied to Mutt's character. He's a young person trying to find his place in the world, and it seems like this adventure would be the perfect opportunity for him to discover what his destiny is. Being the son of Indiana Jones, it makes sense that down the line he would take over for his father. So this should be the journey of him coming to terms with that and discovering that he does have the ability to be an adventurer. Especially if George Lucas wants Shia LaBeouf to take over for Harrison Ford, it seems like that change should have happened in this movie. Or at least started to. Because reportedly, a fifth installment would have both actors in the movie again, but this time Shia taking more control as the main character and Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones taking more of a back seat. And by the end of that movie, passing the torch to Shia. Here's another opportunity for the characters to get to know each other and for us to get to know them as they walk through this marketplace talking about their various histories. Another important element of any kind of story structure is the need for characters to tell us how they're feeling about things. In 99% of the movies, the characters never talk to us, the audience, directly Unless it's something like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where Ferris is always turning at the camera and telling us what he thinks about things. Most of the time, the way we learn about any character is the person they talk to about their feelings. This is known as a window character or a reflection character, and this is taken from the Greeks who discovered it first. In their dramatic structure, they had something called a chorus, which was sort of a group of people who during any play would sit to the side and then turn to the audience and tell them what was going on inside of the characters. The best example today is in reality TV when the characters go to the confession cam. Whatever the reality show, there are always moments when the characters by themselves are talking to the camera and thereby talking to us, and the result is a better understanding of these characters, and we're either rooting for or against them depending on their personas and how they come across during these confession cam moments. When it comes to the movies, we want to know the most about the main character. Therefore, we need to know who their confession cam character is, or who their window, who their reflective character is. If you look at the Matrix, Neo has Morpheus. In Star Wars, Luke has Obi-Wan. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy has three of these reflective characters. Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion. One of my favorite confession cam slash window characters of all time is in Castaway, when Tom Hanks speaks to the inanimate object, the volleyball known as Wilson. And in one of my favorite movies, Die Hard, John McClane, in the first part, talks to Al Powell, the policeman. This is a basic need in all forms of storytelling. So in the movies, we need to have that character that the main character speaks to, and thereby speaks to us through them. The reflective, or the window, or the confession cam character is our representative. It's the audience that the main character speaks to, 
and that's how we bond with them. Again, if you go back and look at your favorite films, they're probably on your top ten list because the main character goes through some kind of a journey, and they spend a good amount of time talking to another character about how they feel about this journey that they're on. What's disappointing here is that neither Indiana nor Mutt are on a journey of personal growth. It's a fun adventure, just kind of this outer journey of searching for the Crystal Skull and finding this lost city, which is okay. Some movies are just these thrill rides where you don't really connect with the main characters, but you kind of just sit beside them and go on this roller coaster of twists and turns and obstacles one after another. And that's what Kingdom of the Crystal Skull turns out to be. A collection of amazing action set pieces that unfortunately don't affect the characters and transform them in any kind of way. This is the responsibility of the filmmakers, and in this case, the ball is dropped. Just as an example, remember in the original Star Wars, there's a couple moments for Luke where the action sequences actually help him to grow as a person. The first happens when the TIE fighters are attacking the Millennium Falcon, and everyone scrambles to take a seat by the gun turrets. It's the same sequence where Han Solo turns to Luke and says, Great kid, don't get cocky. During that action sequence, Luke's really gained some confidence. You can see him growing. He's on a journey. So in the best action movies, there's that dual level, where on the one hand, the character's moving towards an objective, but on the other hand, they're moving towards this thematic journey. And this scene in the cell really reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Dark City. It's really underrated, but there's also this kind of moment where the main character discovers a room with all these carvings and drawings in the walls revealing a secret about the, the main mystery. And also, Indiana climbing up here on the stairs and kind of looking down at the floor is really reminiscent of Last Crusade when he's in the library and he climbs up to the balcony level and looks down and sees the symbol. So this jail cell scene works just fine, but if you've seen a lot of movies, you kind of start recognizing some patterns. But like the saying goes, it's all been done before. The trick is just dressing it up so it looks a little bit different and seems new. So just so we stay in sync, right now I'm watching Mutt climbing up the road to meet Indy at this temple during the night where they're just about to be attacked by the dudes with the masks, by the, like, the parkour kicking, jumping guys. This whole sequence is another example of just the look that doesn't feel like the first three movies. Obviously those movies had some scenes that were filmed on sound stages, but for some reason here, all the soundstage stuff just seems a little bit too obvious or a little hyper-real, and it just doesn't feel like an authentic environment. I do want to mention something here. We see that guy crawling on the tree. Then there's the other guy who was, like, in the ditch a little bit earlier, and this guy just jumped into the well right now. Do these booby trap guys just kind of hang in there and wait for people to show up? This job really needs a lot of patience, because how often do people come looking to uh, visit these catacombs. I'd love to see a scene where these guys are like on the coffee break just kind of sitting around. There's another moment like this coming up, so I'll mention that in about a half hour when we get there. Just to finish the Star Wars thought from a couple of minutes ago, the second example is when Luke, on his own, has to use the Force to destroy the Death Star. It works on two great levels, because here we're in this amazing environment with this metallic moon that can destroy planets, and there's TIE fighters and X-Wings everywhere. And while all that's going on, there's this inner story of Luke learning to trust himself, learning to use his inner power, as Obi-Wan puts it, using the Force, and not trusting technology, but trusting in himself to get the job done. It's a structure that follows Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces, and even though that book is really a compilation of myths and cultural stories shared for over thousands of years, usually verbally and through writing, here we have it perfectly used in this modern medium of cinema. I really believe that if the inner journey of Luke had been taken away from the first Star Wars trilogy, it would not have stood the test of time. Fans would not be so passionate about it. And what's also great about that original trilogy is that Darth Vader also has an inner journey. Luke's journey is about growth, and Darth Vader's journey is about redemption. And that might be why the second Star Wars trilogy isn't as loved and highly regarded as that first trilogy. Because the character whose journey we're following is Darth Vader, and it's one towards self-destruction, and it's one that we already know how it ends. It's more interesting to see his redemption than his downfall. 
even though the second trilogy has thousands of groundbreaking effects in it. So getting back here to Crystal Skull, we have Mutt and Indy in the temple, in the cave. And this is a good parallel to Luke in Empire Strikes Back, where he goes into the cave and faces Darth Vader. That's a very old kind of mythological archetype, where you have to go into the cave and face your fears and face yourself. So here, if Mutt is on any kind of a journey, it would be a perfect time for him to be challenged, face himself, and take a step towards becoming the person he's going to be. But because neither of these characters are on any kind of inner journey, the outer forces aren't being presented to them so that they're forced to deal with these inner issues. Notice that just watching this is so easy. All they're doing is just pushing on this rock or pulling on this cord, and there's no sort of booby trap or anything that's really challenging them. This is kind of reminiscent of that moment in Temple of Doom where Short Round and Indy are in that room and the ceiling is collapsing with the spikes on it, and Willie has to pull the lever with all the insects crawling all over her. That scene is just a lot more fun, first because there's a deadly threat to them, and second because the characters are so alive. Short Round is hilarious, Willie's really annoying and fearful, and Indy's impatient. It just really works with the dynamic with those three characters. Here, Indy and Mutt just kind of walk around and reach their goal with no problem. And that scene with the scorpions was another great example of how CGI and this improved special effects technology actually hurts the Indiana Jones storytelling. In that scene from Temple of Doom where Willie has to reach her hand through all the insects to pull the lever so that the ceiling with all the spikes reverses its direction, we in the audience know that all of those insects are real. Even though we're totally absorbed into the story at that moment, a part of us knows that this actress, Kate Capshaw, had to stand in a room where insects were crawling all over her feet, and she had to reach her hand into a little compartment covered in insects as well. And, of course, the great classic shot of that long centipede thing kind of crawling from her neck down her shirt. That just gives you pure terror. Not a terror that you're going to die, but just an uncomfortable, squirming feeling. I bet that 99% of the people, the first time they saw Temple of Doom and that moment, scratched their arms and checked their feet just to make sure there weren't any bugs around. And that's way more memorable and, more importantly, more effective in getting a reaction from an audience than these CGI scorpions we just saw supposedly crawling all over Shia LaBeouf. And just to get back up to speed at the present moment of the movie, I'm watching the moment where Indy is balancing on that huge stone door closer passageway blocker thing. It's really similar to a set piece that was used a little more dramatically in one of the National Treasure movies. I can't remember if it's the first or second part, but it's basically Nicolas Cage and all of his friends fall down some hole in the floor and they land on this big stone tablet thing that's balanced on a piece of wood. And they basically figure out that one person has to go to the far end so that the other end will go up high enough and they can reach the ledge. That idea was used more effectively in National Treasure because there was a sense of danger. Even though we all know the main character isn't going to die at that moment, there's still that sense that, hey, someone's going to fall off and potentially die. Here, Indy and Mutt pass through that little device without any kind of hitch, without any kind of problem. And throughout this whole mini-temple exploration scene, the only danger's been that parkour guy with the Halloween mask. What's fun about the first three Indiana Jones movies is that we know, of course, he's not going to die during any of the challenges early on. But it's always fun to see how he finds a way out of these situations. He brings his unique perspective and his character to a situation and thinks of something funny or something ingenious that helps him get out of there. This exploration scene is kind of similar to the one in Last Crusade, where Indy and Elsa Schneider go underground beneath the library to find the tomb of a Templar knight that has a clue written on his shield. You might remember that as they were making their way towards that tomb, there was this watery kind of part and all these rats were kind of on the sides. And Elsa was freaked out, but it didn't phase Indy. So while finding the tomb was easy, getting out wasn't, because there was that other guy who's like a protector of the Grail secret, and he actually tries to kill them. He knocks over the gas and sets it on fire, and there's that cool moment when Indy and Elsa have to jump beneath the water to escape it, and then they swim to safety and get in the boat, and then a really cool boat chase occurs. 
Unfortunately, that feeling of danger isn't here in the Crystal Skull. Mutt and Indy have had a pretty easy time and are about to discover the skull in just a couple seconds here. And let's mention a mischaracter development opportunity. Indy and Mutt just cut open this tomb of a famous Spanish explorer. And there's this great CGI shot of the explorer's face as almost pretty much a young man. And within seconds, it deteriorates into this mummified corpse. What a really great parallel for the character of Indiana Jones. Just like this Spanish conquistador explored the ancient mysteries, Indiana Jones is the modern-day explorer trying to find out the secrets of today's mysteries. Combine that with the recent death of his father and his friend Marcus, and Indiana Jones should be in a place where he's thinking about his own mortality. It could be really interesting, because here's this guy, this adventurer, who's always exploring these caves and finding these tombs, and a lot of times, he's finding the final resting place of his counterparts from decades past. You gotta wonder if somewhere within Indiana Jones, he thinks that he might end up just like these people that he keeps finding. It's too bad that he never raises the question of how many of these adventures does he have left in him. And that would have been something to bring up in the hamburger joint when Mutt first asked Indy to go on this adventure. That was really the original missed opportunity to establish Indiana Jones' point of view in 1957. How has he changed since the last time we saw him? And what does he think about the future and his current place in life? And here's a great shot, another metaphor for this inner journey that Indy could have gone on, where he gives Mutt the corpse of this explorer still in his armor. I'm not saying that Indy should have been waking up from these nightmares where he's exploring a cave and he finds this skeleton that has his hat and whip. That would make it a little bit hokey, and the Indy movies have never really done that kind of thing. At least not that blatantly. What's worked in the past, and what needed to be done here, was a solid window character or reflection character, that confession cam character, that hears the inner fears and thoughts of the main character, in this case, Indiana Jones. Getting back to the present moment of the movie, Indiana is holding the crystal skull. They've discovered it, and Mutt's knife just flew out of his hand and magnetized to it. Let's talk about the third major reason why the movie doesn't feel right. Why, overall, it just doesn't work. And just to review, the first reason is Indiana Jones. He doesn't have any kind of character depth, doesn't have any kind of inner journey, and that relates to the lack of a strong window character, reflection character, or confession cam character, as I've been calling it. The second reason is the opponent, and the overall feeling that there's a lack of a threat from that opponent. And the further notion that Arena, as an opponent, is just a weak, underdeveloped character that doesn't feel threatening, and never really convinces us as an audience that she has the power and capabilities to defeat the main character. The third is the Crystal Skull and the lack of mythology. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, we understood that within the Ark was like the force and the power of God. And because there was a strong, well-established opponent in the Nazis and Adolf Hitler, we knew that if they got their hands on this powerful artifact, the world would be in trouble. The Last Crusade also has a really well-developed objective that everyone wants, the Holy Grail. And the mythology and the sense of mystery is really well-established for it. The way that happens is that every character they run into is talking about it. First, there's Walter Donovan, the American businessman who invites Indy to his apartment to offer him the job of finding the grail and then reveals that Indy's father has gone missing. Then there's Elsa, Marcus, Indy's dad, and pretty much everyone else in the movie talking non-stop about the significance of the Holy Grail. After all this mystery talk, we learn that the grail gives eternal life. And with the evil opponent of the Nazi party going after it, we know that if it falls into their hands, the world's really in trouble. In the Temple of Doom, the mythology centers around two factors. First, the Shiva Lingam Stones. The second is the continued existence of the Thuggy Cult. So while the action sequences and the set pieces in Temple of Doom are really engaging, we never fully understand what it means if the Thuggies get the Lingam Stones and they use them and what kind of threat they'll be to the modern world. That lack of providing a complete mythology and a picture of what the threat to the rest of the world would be is something that Temple of Doom has in common with Crystal Skull. In this scene here where Indy's strapped into kind of some sort of dentist chair and is about to look into the eyes of the Crystal Skull in a couple of minutes, we're going to learn what the Soviets, what the communists have as a plan for it. World mind control. It's actually a pretty inventive plan, 
And I like the way that Arena tells Indy the way the Soviets plan to use it, where eventually people won't realize that the thoughts they're having aren't their own thoughts. The major problem is that we don't understand how that's going to work. How does the skull possess this power, and how would someone channel it and use it against everyone else? Something that should have been done here is just give us a little bit of a taste of its power early. Let us see that there's some action to back up the talk of what this thing could do. We're one hour into the movie, and we haven't seen anything related to the power of the aliens or the crystal skull. We've seen one body for like a couple seconds, and we've seen the skull for a couple scenes. Another problem with the creation of this mythology is that the time period isn't really used here. The only way we know it's the late 1950s is the subtitle that pointed out it's 1957 and the fact that there were some young kids listening to 50s music and racing down a street, as well as the greaser versus preppy scene in the hamburger joint. Aside from that, we can't really feel that it's the 1950s. Raiders and Last Crusade were great because they put us into this environment of the late 30s as the Nazis were coming to power and World War II was just around the corner. Here, the Cold War is only 12 years old, tensions are still mounting between East and West. The Red Scare and Communist blacklisting is just coming to an end in 1957, and B-movies are filled with UFO themes. For example, The Day the Earth Stood Still came out in 1951, and in 1956, there was Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And with Roswell just 10 years old, this should very much be in the public consciousness. Combine that with the technology explosion of post-World War II, and there's a ton of awareness about little green men and flying saucers. This is something that Indy should be really interested in, especially since he knows these mythological stories about times past. And recently in movies, the idea that UFOs aren't a new phenomenon to the 20th century has been explored. The best example of this is 1994 Stargate which dealt with the whole idea that the pyramids of Egypt weren't built by humans, and they were the work of aliens, which was based on a book from 1968, Eric von Daniken, titled Chariots of the Gods. And he was really the first to bring this idea to popular culture, that aliens were responsible for building the pyramids, as well as other pyramid sites around the world. It might have been interesting to take the real Eric Von Daniken and give Indy some of his passion for this not-so-mainstream idea about the purpose of pyramids. This could work because, as is already established in the movie, Indy was there at Roswell in 47. That could have really influenced and challenged his beliefs. And second, he's well-versed in this history of ancient myths and stories. This recent idea of flying saucers and little green men could have put a new spin on how he views these ancient stories. To use the X-Files example again, right now Indy is more Scully and less Mulder, if Mulder is the believer and Scully is the skeptic. It feels like Indy is a skeptic just for the sake of being a skeptic. It would be a little more interesting if there was a part of him that really believed. He's seen so many fantastic things throughout his other adventures that you feel he would have a little more open-mindedness to something so fantastic as aliens and a crystal skull. That would be a great way for this adventure to affect the personality and the character of Indy. But instead of a growing or changing Indy, we just get a static action hero. A person we just go along with for the twists and turns, the ups and downs of this great roller coaster ride. Which is fun and definitely dazzles the senses, but in the end leaves you kind of feeling a little bit empty. And that ends up being a letdown because the end of The Last Crusade leaves you on such a high emotional note. Mainly because Indy and his father have reconnected, but you also have Marcus and Sala there, so like the whole band of friends are together. And then the last shot is they classically ride off into the sunset. It works so well, and you're left with this nice kind of warm feeling that your movie friends are going to be okay. And more importantly, if this is the last time that you see them, you feel like it was a solid send-off. The feeling you get here with Crystal Skull is that they're trying to set up another sequel where Shia is going to take the reins away from Harrison Ford. Let's continue with this line of thinking in just a second, I want to focus on this moment here where Irina just told Indy that the skull does not speak to everyone. And she says that because Indy responds, I have a better idea, why don't you look at it? This is a really important moment for Irina's character because she's the true believer here and she really wants to believe, she wants this power. It's pretty nice the way she says that line because there's this hint 
of disappointment in her voice. And in terms of her character, that element isn't explored enough. Right now she comes off as the twirlier mustache, two-dimensional bad guy. And her character would have benefited from a little more time of exploration and revealing how she feels about things. When we as an audience think about who our favorite opponents have been, more than likely a common factor will be that these opponents had time to reveal to us, the audience, who they were, how they felt about things, and what they wanted. In other words, the filmmakers treated them with as much respect as the main character. In the original Star Wars trilogy, the reason we all like Darth Vader so much, other than he looks cool, is that he's given a lot of screen time to share his personal views. We find out how he feels about the dark side, and how he feels about the rebels. Then, added to that, is the fact that all the other characters keep talking about him. The result is that we as an audience learn a lot about this character from a lot of different angles, and we start to become sympathetic to a person that we're supposed to hate. When this happens, watching a movie becomes really fun. Because on the one side, you're rooting for the main character to defeat this opponent, and on the other, you kind of don't want to see this opponent get defeated. A lot of times you might be thinking, well, if they could only find a way to get along, they might actually end up becoming friends. Here, that thought never crosses our minds regarding Arena. And it's too bad, because there was really an opportunity to develop her in a deeper sort of way. For example, in this moment here, as Indy is staring at the skull, and he's kind of shaking and being affected by it, it would have been great to have a close-up of Arena kind of looking on in a jealous kind of way, because she wants to be the one that's communicating with. She's the one who believes that she deserves to be connected to this greater power, because she believes so much in it. And the fact that Indy actually had a reaction to the skull should really drive her crazy. So those close-ups of her reacting to his reaction are missing here. Instead, we get a ton of shots of this kind of side view where the tent has the shadow of Indy's head. We see that like four or five times. And it looks great, but it's not what's important in that moment. The emotional dynamic was between Indy, the skull, and Arena. And unfortunately, it wasn't totally captured. And here in this scene, instead of the characters being explored through their emotions and their beliefs and who they are, we get more props and wacky actions. What seems to define Arena is this saber, this sword. So she just pulls it out and threatens Shia with it. And Shia, who also kind of has his own little mini saber, the switchblade, here pulls out the comb. And he's a greaser, so he combs his hair and he says he's ready. That definitely gets a laugh, but it just seems so absurd. And all of a sudden, Arena says, well, I must have chosen the wrong pressure point. You've combed your hair, and you're ready to die. I can't actually kill you and follow through with my threat. I'm going to have to pull some other trick out. And her other trick is revealing Marion. When this movie was in production and about to come out, anyone who watched any kind of news channel or surfed the net for any news regarding Indy knew that Marion was going to be in the movie. So it ended up being more of a great idea instead of a big surprise. What's actually strange here is how fast Indiana recognizes her. Remember the conversation earlier where Mutt and Indy were in that coffee shop hamburger joint? Mutt mentioned the name Marion, and Indy's response was, There's been a lot of Marions, kid. So it seems he's blocked her out of his memory, and along with that, probably his emotional reactions to her. More than likely, he's not going to forget what she looks like, but he might be slow to react to her. He might try to hide his feelings and how seeing her again is affecting him. So if this script were to have a rewrite, this scene here is directly related to the scene in that hamburger shop. You'd have to go back to that scene with Indian Mud and insert some more emotional subtext as he's reacting to the name Marion. And if you want to rewrite it even more, that hamburger joint scene is related to the scene where Indy's talking to that new dean of students regarding the death of Marcus and his father. That seems to be the moment where you'd be able to work in a little bit of this theme subtext for Indy regarding him dealing with his own mortality as he's getting older, as he's losing more and more people around him, and being this adventurer who might end up dying on one of his chases and not leave anyone behind who will remember him or even care that he's gone. If all these elements regarding Indy's character were in place, the movie would have felt a little more deeper, and when we left it, it would have had a stronger impact on us than just going on a roller coaster ride and saying, well, that was fun, but I'm going to forget about it in about 20 minutes. 
In the most engaging movies, we, the audience, become the main character, and we're in his or her shoes, and we feel what they feel. The problem becomes, if they're not feeling much, because their emotions and their themes aren't really being explored, then we're not feeling much. Speaking of adventures and a roller coaster ride and a chase, for an example, let's look at that show, The Amazing Race. It's been on a bunch of seasons, and we pretty much know the format. A bunch of teams made up of two people have to race around the world and hit these checkpoints and, and get there first in order to win the prize. The reason we as an audience want to keep tuning in is not because of the locations. It's definitely cool that they get to go to all these exotic locales and experience interesting cultures. But the real reason we keep tuning in is because we get to know the contestants. We as an audience start bonding with them because we listen to their confession cam moments and we see how the adventure affects them as people. That's the real interest in any of these reality TV shows, whether it's Survivor or The Biggest Loser. Through these confession cam moments and being there to witness their tears and joy as they battle opponents and overcome obstacles, we take part in their triumphs and their failures. We feel like we know them and we root for them or against them. But most importantly, we're engaged not because of the things going on around them, but the things going on within them. So imagine if The Crystal Skull would have been a reality TV show adventure. If it was The Amazing Race, Battle for the Crystal Skull. I'm going to cast my vote and say that would have been more engaging than this because based on the format of The Amazing Race and all reality shows, you can't get away from the idea of a confession camp. You have to get to know the people that are involved. Since a movie is only two hours, it's a little bit easier to ignore those elements focus on the special effects in the genre set pieces, and feel like a quality story has been delivered. When in the end, it feels like you went to dinner to have a nice nutritious meal, but you ended up getting a super sweet, overwhelming dessert. And this moment that just happened where Mutt flipped over the table and started this escape for everyone feels a little bit forced. Up to that moment, Mutt is really passive, very quiet. We're not getting any close-ups, we're not getting any reactions to what's going on, through his eyes so we don't know what's going on inside of him and all of a sudden he just decides to get this pissed off look on his face and take some action. From a screenwriting structural point of view this is the right moment for this to happen because it's been a few minutes since the last action sequence. Unfortunately it seems a little bit unmotivated to happen through the Mutt Williams character. And it leads to this quicksand scene which is pretty cool but also pretty ridiculous. First because it looks really really fake. Again, the great thing about the other indie movies is that they didn't feel like they were on a soundstage. Here, it feels like the trees are plastic, and you get the sense that there's a platform slowly lowering and lowering them. This is a comedic moment that seems to want to be as good as something from The Last Crusade, but because we don't really know all the characters and the dynamics aren't really working as well, it feels a little bit forced and it's not as funny as it should be. Remember, it's not the location in a movie that makes something interesting, it's the people and the dynamic between them within that location that makes it engaging and entertaining. Just for fun, let's take Marion out of this quicksand scene and let's put in Indy's dad. It becomes a little bit more interesting, doesn't it? Because Indy's dad is a well-established, thought-out character. And most importantly, the relationship between Indiana and his father is very strong. There are a lot of memories and emotions and conflicts between them that are constantly being aggravated by the situations that they're in. One major flaw in the Marion character in this movie is that she doesn't come into it with any kind of backstory. There are some details here and there about what she did after she broke up with Indiana Jones, but the most important element is how she felt about breaking up with Indy and not seeing him for so long and raising a kid on her own. Those issues aren't brought into the movie. And they're not supposed to be brought in in terms of Marion shows up and spends 10 minutes talking about how she feels, but just put it beneath the surface within her. Basically, make her have a chip on her shoulder. In general, the main character should never have an easy time achieving the objective, battling the opponent, or even having relationships with those around him. It's much more engaging and fun for us as an audience when the main character seems to be at odds with almost everybody in the movie especially when it comes to the dynamic of a man and woman who used to date and love each other. In that case, nothing should ever be easy. And when Marion was introduced here, when Arena brought her out, she had a smile on her face. Instead, she should have had a pissed off look, or she should have had a smile, and then when she got closer to Indy, she should have slapped him. 
And just to finish up a thought on this quicksand scene, besides looking fake, the end of it is a little bit ridiculous, where Mutt shows up with a python, and of course Indy's afraid of snakes, so he doesn't want to grab it, but it gets a little ridiculous when he tells Mutt to call it a rope, and then he'll be able to grab it. And it doesn't help that the whole scene feels fake, so we never really feel like he's in any danger, and we end up just sitting there thinking, well, it's supposed to be a funny scene, and I should be laughing, so why not let out a giggle here and there? But overall, it seems very forced. The true motivation for the scene is that Marion tells Indy that Mutt is his son, and she says she did that because she thought they were going to die. The problem here is that how come everyone in the audience knew it before Indy? It would have worked better if Marion and Indy weren't getting along, if she hated him or had some kind of resentment towards him, and earlier when she was introduced, Indy was looking back between Marion and Mutt and Mutt to Marion, Indy on his own would have realized what's going on. So then later in the quicksand scene, Indiana is the one to bring up the subject and say, that's my son, isn't it? In The Crystal Skull, it just seems for the first time out of the four movies that Indiana Jones doesn't really know what's going on with anything. In the first three movies, he always knows the legend, the myth, the tricks. He always knows how to get through the traps, and he always knows where to find the clues. Here, he's kind of just like, okay, Crystal Skull, Akabar, kind of heard some things, but whatever. And then Mary and uh, don't really know her, and then, oh... What? That's my son? I had no idea that that could be my son. It almost seems that Indy isn't his usual sharp self, because if he was, the path of the story would have been altered. That if the character of Indy, if the inner emotions and the issues that he had, if those were allowed to determine what he did in the story, it wouldn't follow the pre-established genre set pieces that were thought of for the sequel. Here in the back of the truck, things finally get interesting for Indy and Marion because they have their first fight. But unfortunately, it's also their last. For the rest of the movie, they'll pretty much be getting along. And that's too bad because here we get a peek of what could have been. To compare their relationship in Raiders, they really don't like each other for 60 or 70 percent of that movie. It's only towards the end after she gets captured that she starts being happy whenever Indiana's around. But from the moment they meet... Up until that moment they get captured, there's this level of, I hate you because of what you did to me when we were younger. And it's too bad that the promise of this moment here, where there's like this frustration of the relationship, it pretty much stops here in the truck and doesn't continue throughout. Also, one element that's missing here is Mutt Williams' reaction to the news that Indiana is his father. He has this initial kind of, no, I don't believe this guy's my dad, but we don't really get any more close-ups of him, and we don't get a sense of how he truly feels, of how it's felt to think someone was your dad and that he died when you were younger, and only to realize that this guy that you just recently met that you think's pretty cool, full of surprises and kind of an action-adventure hero we kind of guy, that he's in fact your father. In terms of the action, it's the usual pretty amazing Indiana Jones kind of stuff. The scene in the back of the truck where they all take turns kicking the guy as a family is really funny. And it literally kicks off a huge action sequence that's going to go for like the next 15 minutes. Which is actually an insane amount of time for an action sequence to take. Out of this two hour movie, that's one eighth of the screen time devoted to just this action sequence. I know I keep harking about character development and inner emotions, but it's really important when the time is there for characters to reveal how they feel, that really needs to be taken advantage of because... If you're having an action sequence that lasts for one-eighth of the movie, you have to know what it means to the characters, why they're fighting for it, what's motivating them, and why they care. In a drama, characters fight using words. And in an action movie, and in an action movie the words are usually replaced with fists, guns, and explosives. But just because the way they fight is different doesn't mean the reason they fight is different. In a drama... The motivating force behind the words is the subtext, the inner emotions and the struggles within the character. In an action movie, those same motivations are there at the core, except here they're just being expressed in a little more overt and violent manner. Don't get me wrong, on just a purely entertaining action, let's just watch this amazing sequence kind of level, this really works. It's really up there with the tank sequence from Last Crusade and the famous truck chase sequence from Raiders of the Lost Ark. This has really become a signature of the Indiana Jones franchise. But just to mention a little pet peeve once again, 
Does anyone else feel that this is a little bit too stagey and it doesn't feel as real as the other chases? It's a little bit too clean and feels like it's on a soundstage. Let's take this time to do a little screenwriting checklist for character motivations. During this fight, as we're watching, what's at stake for all the characters? Obviously, they're all fighting over the skull. But what does that exactly mean? What's at stake if you get the skull or if you lose the skull? If Arena has the skull, what is she going to use it for? We've had a little bit of the mythology mentioned, but there's no real consequence that we know. In Raiders, we know that the Ark contains this wrath of God. In Last Crusade, we know that the cup gives eternal life. If the stakes were a little more established, we'd be a little bit more engaged in the scene and we'd be a lot more worried. As it is now, we have a vague idea, which is just enough for us to be concerned. And the main reason we're watching is the pretty amazing action that's going on. It's definitely fun, and there's this nice level of action, violence, and comedy, which is a usual trademark of Indiana Jones. Also, each character gets a chance to shine in the spotlight during this battle. Here we have Mud with the saber, and he's about to duel Arena. And you might remember that this was kind of set up earlier, when Mutt was talking to Indy about what he did with school and why he quit, and he mentioned that, oh, it was really boring and he just learned how to fence. A little bit too obvious of a setup for this duel that's coming up. That he's the only one with the training, and it just so happens that the, the bad guy, the villain, is obsessed with carrying this sword around, so Mutt is the only one with the skills to take her on. Meanwhile, Indy has Mac in a headlock, and Mac is trying to defect back to his side, saying that he's been a double agent all along. There is a bit of a problem with his motivation. In this moment during the chase, Arena and the Soviets do not know that they're going to lose this battle. They don't know that Indy is going to take the skull and escape. So later, in about a half hour, we're going to find out Mac is still working for the Soviets, and he's been dropping these little homing devices, these trackers. So does that mean at this moment, Arena told Mac, defect back to Indy's side just in case we lose the skull and we're not able to find Akbar? Or was it just Mac being greedy, figuring that Indy has the skull and he's going to know how to find it, so he wants to be on the winning side and collect some gold and treasure? But that doesn't make sense, because why would he be dropping the homing devices, telling the Russians where he's at if he's just after the money? Why would he care if the Russians find it or not? After thinking about Max's motivation, there's one higher motivation that becomes obvious, that of the screenwriter. The problem is, how do the Russians know where Akbar is once Indy and everyone escape with the skull? That seemed to be the problem during the story development process, so this solution was thought of, that Mac would defect and drop the homing devices and the Russians would find them. A little bit illogical, but it does the job. What would have been stronger was a character-based motivation or a character-based skill that led the Russians to Akbar. It could be tied in with Arena. Again, she thinks she's psychic, maybe she does have some sort of ability, and she's really frustrated that it's not stronger and she wants it to be more powerful. That's why she's after the skull and wants to tap into its powers and find Akbar because she believes she's a chosen one. As mentioned earlier, she's a little more developed, a little more powerful, and somehow becomes connected to Indy during the earlier scene where he looks into the skull. Or she just has some device that allows her to amplify her mental powers that led her to follow Indy to Akbar. That's really the beauty of basing the story within the character's motivations. If you stay honest to who the people are, what they want, and what kind of personalities and abilities they have, the answers really present themselves once the questions are asked of what these people would do and how they would respond to these situations. And speaking of situations, this action sequence is really kicking some good ass. A lot of fun to watch. There are a couple moments to discuss, though. First, pretty much anything Mutt Williams does, especially the sword fight, and when he has each of his feet on a separate car, when he basically does the splits while riding between two cars. It's just so ridiculous, over the top. You can definitely see that there's a little bit of CGI going on. It almost looks like his legs are a little too stretched, and then he's kind of getting hit in the balls with the plants, which has a nice comedy element to it, but it's just a little bit too unbelievable. But then there's this other really great moment where Arena falls into the same car where Marion is, 
and there's this classic kind of Spielberg shot. He's so good at this, putting a little bit of comedy in the middle of a tense action moment. When it's a tight shot of Arena, and it starts to pull back, and she looks up, and Marion's there, and they have this moment of recognizing what the situation is between them, and then Arena takes action, pulling out the sword, and Marion hits the brakes, and Arena goes flipping over on the hood of the car. That's followed up with the second most unbelievable moment of the movie. It's even beyond unbelievable. It's horrible. It's nuke the fridge bad. It's Shia as Tarzan. Mutt Williams swinging through the jungle using vines. With an army of monkeys going along with them. What the F? Watching this in the theater, this was the official moment when I started to tune out. When I just thought, this is no longer a true Indiana Jones movie. It's just so redonkulous. Does anyone else feel like this scene got written in because someone lost a bet? Like late one night, the screenwriters Spielberg and Lucas were playing Texas Hold'em. And the stakes got too high and the screenwriters threw in this idea that if they win this hand, they want to put this scene where Shia swings from the vines with monkeys. I think this might qualify as the first great mystery of the 21st century. In the 20th century, we had plenty of mysteries. Is there a Bigfoot? Were there really aliens at Roswell in 1947? Who shot JFK? In the 21st century, the mystery is, whose idea was it to have Shia swinging from the vines, and how did it make it into the final cut? It feels out of place because it's something Indiana Jones would never do. He's never done anything that ridiculous. And that's a major problem with this action sequence. At the beginning, Indy's pretty active. But towards the last half of it, he really becomes a passive observer. He's basically just driving the car and then glancing at Shia and grinning as he's doing all these great action moves, thinking, that's my boy. And that's something we're not used to. And Indy, who's waiting for other people to take care of the situation. Usually he's the one with the ideas, the ingenuity, and the courage to do what needs to be done. It's obvious why Indy's just standing by. The franchise is going to move into Shia LaBeouf's hands. So here, the character of Mutt Williams needs to be set up as someone who can be an action hero like his father. The major problem, again, is that nothing here is character-based. It's just screenwriting by numbers by figuring out the overall story and then forcing the characters to go through these plot points of this needs to happen here, this is when there's the chase, and Mutt needs to get the skull here, so he's got to figure out some way to do it, and he swings on the vines. Basing all this in character would have probably gone something like this. Mutt Williams is a lost soul. He lost his father, or who he thought was his father, when he was young. He's dropped out of school, and he's working as a mechanic. He doesn't really know what he needs to do in life, or what he wants to do, but he feels he has a greater purpose. His mom gets kidnapped, and Ox, his father figure, goes missing. He finds out about his mom's old friend, Indiana Jones, so he goes to visit him. And as he goes on this adventure with this stranger, he discovers some of his limitations, that maybe he's not as courageous as he thinks he is, he pretends to be this tough greaser, but really inside he's scared of taking any risks. So this adventure is going to open him up. It's going to lead him to challenge himself and develop these new abilities or realize these abilities that he's always had. After all, he is the son of Indiana Jones, so maybe there are some instinctive automatic abilities that lend themselves to being an adventurer. On the other side, you have Indiana Jones, who, as I've talked about already, is older, he's lost his father, his friend Marcus, and he doesn't have a kid or a wife, so maybe he's thinking about his mortality. This adventure should help him realize that it's time to pass this baton of adventuring to someone else. He might not be looking for a replacement consciously, but within himself he might be thinking he needs to get out of this game. So then when he meets Marion and finds out that Mutt is his son, this should really open up these submerged feelings and thoughts that he's had. And there's already that great scene where Indy and Mutt talk about Mutt's schooling and what is he going to do with his life. So it's already setting all that up. Here in this sequence, that should really come to the surface. It should really express itself in Mutt empowering himself and becoming more of an adventurer. And the way that we, the audience, would buy that the focus is shifting from Indy to Mutt is that during this action sequence, Indy should get injured somehow. He should get shot or get a broken arm. 
In the previous movies, he's never been afraid to get bloodied and bruised. So here, he's obviously thinking he's just going to do his usual business, punch this guy, dive after that guy. But because he's older and maybe a little bit more tired, things don't turn out the way they have in the past. It would have been a little more interesting and had a stronger comedic element to the film if Indy would have acknowledged his age. Overall, it's great and pretty amazing that Harrison Ford still virtually looks like he did 20 years ago when they made Last Crusade. He's still got the energy and the Indiana Jones look. But what if this story would have acknowledged that he's getting older and he's a little more frail and he doesn't move as quickly as he used to? Character-wise, it could be something similar to Lethal Weapon 2, where Murtaugh's planning retirement. I think in that one, Murtaugh's always saying, I'm getting too old for this And that's a missing element here, giving Indiana Jones a little more of an updated perspective about life and about himself. It almost feels like even though it's been 19 years since the last adventure, not much has changed within him. So overall, the motivations would have worked better if Indy would have been feeling his age and have gotten injured in this moment, and then Mutt would have had to step up his game and become a stronger, more confident adventurer and show us that he can eventually take over for his father. It seems that the movie wasn't sure what it wanted to do with both of these characters. Was this an Indiana Jones as a main character movie, or was it a Mutt Williams taking over for his father movie? It kind of tried to have it both ways, and in the end, felt like it didn't belong to either of them. The scene that just finished up with the oversized ants attacking everyone is really a great idea. It might be my favorite moment of the movie. And even though I've been preaching about how I love Indiana Jones because it never uses special effects in any green screen, it's always set in reality in real locations and uses real life stunts, this scene deserves credit because the creativity is really great. Just like Temple of Doom, it really plays on our fears of insects. And you gotta love that moment when the ants showed the intelligence to climb on each other's backs and try to reach Arena as she was hanging from a tree. But the best moment has to be when Indy's fighting the Russian and he knocks him out and the ants swarm him and carry him back into their little ant hill home. Really creepy and uncomfortable. Right after that is another action moment inspired by Temple of Doom where Marion takes the car and races it off the ledge, landing on the tree and then landing into the river. That's very reminiscent of Indy inflating the raft, jumping out of the plane, and landing on the mountain with the snow, and then sliding down it. Same thing here where they start going down the different waterfalls. And equally as unbelievable. Here you may even need to suspend your disbelief a little bit more, especially when they fall down the third waterfall. Now I don't know about anyone else, but have you ever during the summer gone to the end of your block at the corner and opened up the fire hydrant. If you ever step in front of the fire hydrant, the pressure and the power of the water just catapults you back. Now, a waterfall's got to be like a hundred times the power of that. So once they go down the third fall here and they're totally submerged and the water is just pounding on them, everyone comes up no problem and the crystal skull also doesn't get lost. So you kind of wonder about that. And look at this. They actually fall out of the car as they fall down the waterfall which behind Nuke the Fridge and Mutt as Tarzan is the third ridiculous moment of the movie. Then they all swim to safety towards the shore, and Marion's sitting there with the steering wheel in her hand. Now again, if that logic part of your brain is active and it's turned on and it hasn't been lobotomized by the absurdity of Nuke the Fridge and Tarzan swinging in the vines, then you just got to wonder, okay, you just saw her fall out of the car. How is it that she ended up with the steering wheel? But let's not get up in nitpicking and let's just try to enjoy this adventure because it's obvious it's not totally based in reality and it's a heightened version of that and it's just meant to take us on a wild ride. Even though you can go watch the Mummy trilogy or the Laura Croft movies and get the same kind of feeling as you're getting here. What's happened is that the characters aren't affecting the action as much as they should be. The action isn't coming from the characters' personalities and their emotions, and therefore it feels very generic. It just feels like these characters are literally in that car taking a ride down this waterfall. The waterfall is just a metaphor for the movie where it's just a a wild ride with its ups and downs, and the characters are just locked into this car having to obey the course of where the story and the plot has to go or wants to go. 
For example, Marion's decision to jump the car off the ledge into the water just felt very arbitrary. There's no real reason why she would have done that. There's actually a close-up of her as she's making the decision to put the pedal to the metal and jump the car off, and she actually looks a little bit insane. She looks like she's losing her mind, and I don't think that's the intention there. What probably should have happened was keep this antagonistic relationship between her and Indy alive, and they should have been bickering. They should have been like this married couple or this couple that's been divorced or broken up, as they have been, and just they're at each other's throats. They're arguing, and they're getting frustrated, and Indy's trying to take control, and she doesn't want to give control. She wants to find these ways, these moments, to have power over him, and she's the one that decides, out of spite, out of a sort of personal vengeance to Indy, to to be the one that's in control, to override his decision and to jump off maybe even if that line of Indy being a little bit afraid or a little bit older and a little bit unsure of himself if that's followed through maybe he's too scared or he's a little bit hesitant to do this and she decides to jump off the ledge just to kind of push his buttons and make him sweat a little bit that would have been based in character and it would have had this extra level because on the one level we're already enjoying it while wow, they're gonna jump off the ledge it's gonna be really fun they hit the tree they knock off some Russians they land in the water That's a really fun time, but also you can add the second level of character, the battle that's going on between these characters. And these two levels would have been working together. Instead, we just have this singular level, which is the pursuit of objective, the fighting against opponents, but the lack of these inner relationships within the characters. And here's what should be an iconic classic moment in the Indiana Jones series. They're in the cave, and Ox is holding up the skull to the cave painting where it shows the alien and the skull is matched exactly to the shape of the alien head on the wall. The problem here is that the mythology, again, hasn't been built up enough. This is like in Last Crusade when Indy enters the cave and realizes that he has to go through the three different tests and that the grail is just around the corner. We all know what the grail means to him, his father, and to society in general. We know what the mythology means to the world, especially to Christianity. Same thing in Raiders of the Lost Ark. We understand what it means to everyone involved. Here, we still don't know what the impact of the crystal skull, of the knowledge that aliens were here and built these temples, and that they actually exist. There's no discussion of what the impact's going to be on the characters and especially on the world. Indy should be the one reflecting that. He's the one who's versed. He's a walking encyclopedia of archaeology, of history, of myths, of legends. This should be affecting him and his beliefs, and he should know what's going to happen if this gets out, and the rest of the world learns this truth. Here's ridiculous moment number four. Indy and everyone are walking through the temple, and there's this close-up of a little statue mask on the wall, and these eyes appear in the mask. Then there's a shot of Indy and everyone walking further through the temple, and then behind them, these native protectors start climbing out of the walls through the statues. It's definitely a great visual, but when you stop and think about it, this means that these protectors sit and wait inside of the walls for someone to come by, and then when they finally do, they break through all the stone and all this elaborate decoration on the wall to start running after them. Okay, how often does anyone walk through this place? So how long are these people sitting within the walls? And what happens if there's a false alarm? Like if protector number four thinks he saw something and he makes a move and breaks through his little protective statue thing and then everyone else follows and they discover that it's just a spider or or some goat was just walking through. That's probably a group of protectors that are really pissed off and annoyed because now they have to rebuild this whole fake on the wall and climb back into it. Really impractical and obviously illogical, but it makes for a great visual. And then out on the temple stairs as they're running down and all these protectors emerge from every single exit possible and start chasing after them, that's a really great looking scene. And they're kind of slinging these rocks. And it's basically a cliche action scene where the the bad guys here have rocks instead of machine guns. Just like the machine gun bullets, they miss the good guys, of course. And then when they do hit a couple of them, there's no real damage to these characters And all Indy needs to do is just hold up the skull, and just like the ants, these primitive protectors bow down and are all scared of it. So, kind of a cliche response there and solution to get out of the situation, but we'll go with it, because the story at this point is focused less on the characters and more on... 
this raging river of just momentum. Just get us to inside the secret location so we can get to the aliens and the multidimensional transporting ship. To compare Crystal Skull again with The Amazing Race, we've just seen two solid action sequences. And in The Amazing Race, following any kind of action moments or when they're chasing and racing, you need those confession cam moments. You need a little bit of downtime so the characters can express how they feel about things. In terms of a movie, they don't express it to a camera, they express it to each other. That didn't happen here, so it just feels like we're on a non-stop roller coaster ride, and we're not getting to know the characters. We're just watching some people be moved along this course of action. Here, Indy figures how to open up this secret entrance to the inner cave. And it's pretty interesting. It's... It's unique enough, but it also doesn't feel like it's blowing us away. Again, we've seen the two National Treasure movies, and they have some pretty inventive secret passages and clues you have to unravel. So here, Crystal Skull really had to one-up it. I don't know if it totally blew us away, but it did it enough to make us interested. A key factor missing in this moment is, again, character, especially Indiana Jones. There should be some kind of excitement, especially... A close-up that captures some sort of emotional information on his face as he figures out how to open this thing up. Unfortunately, there's no invested emotion and curiosity on his part. So this is kind of just him going through the motions. There really wasn't a close-up once of him as he was figuring out how to open this up. If you go back to Crusade, as he's reading his father's journal, there's a lot of close-ups, and as he's following the clues, breaking the code and figuring out how things work really affect him on an inner level. So here the pillars are coming together, the sand drops out of the way, and they fall onto the stairs, which are about to recede into the wall. This is a really great idea, creates a lot of tension, and really gets you interested in, are the characters going to make it? In these kind of moments, I always like to pay attention to how far the stairs are receded in one shot, and then when they cut back to the character, and then when they cut back to the stairs, how much further they've gone in, just to see if it's consistent. I think in Raiders there was something like this, where the door was coming down, and Indy was trapped. He was holding onto the ledge about to fall in, and the door's getting closer and closer to the ground, and it just seems like it should be closed already, and Indy just seems to make it, even though we know the door would have closed. We kind of just suspend our disbelief just to enjoy it. Same thing here with the stairs. There were a couple shots where it seemed like they should have fallen sooner, but obviously that would have ruined the end of the movie if they all would have fallen the spikes. One setup that hasn't totally paid off yet is Indy looking into the skull. There was a scene a little while ago where Indy said, I have to return it, and someone asked him why, and he said, because the skull told me I have to. Oxley has looked into the skull, and he's really been affected by it. He's kind of gone a little bit insane. And even though we've seen Indy look into the skull, and he just said that the skull talked to him, he really hasn't shown any other kind of adverse effects. This is another golden missed opportunity to explore Indy's character, to affect his personality, and to reveal some emotional battles that are going on within him. But to get to that point, you'd have to set up all the backstory of how Indy went to Roswell in 47, and it changed his views on history, on archaeology. Maybe it made him a little bit crazy, or he felt a little bit kooky, and he's had new beliefs regarding aliens and the history of religion and all these other things. And now that he's had contact with the skull, maybe he has a power, or he's developed a little more ESP. Somehow it's affected him, and he's a little bit of a different character. It would really be interesting if this hero that we're used to suddenly had a different personality or suddenly was under the control of something or was fighting against something. We'd be rooting for him even more. And this would make his relationship with his opponent even stronger since it's been hinted that Arena is this believer in like the ESP and occultism, psychic powers, and she hasn't really been fulfilled. She's searching for this meaning. She's hoping that this skull will lead her to something more. As we know later on, when she's looking the alien face to face, she says she's ready. So what if she knew that the skull had affected Indy more than it had affected her? Remember, she tried to look into it, but as she said, it doesn't affect everyone, or it doesn't respond to everyone. That should really piss her off, and it should make her hate Indy even more. And what if the skull had tapped into his ESP, and now he was communicating with Irina, or they were linked somehow? Anything that would make the main character and the opponent have a closer relationship would make the antagonism between them that much more interesting. Think of Hannibal Lecter and Jodie Foster. Technically, Hannibal is her opponent, but in a lot of ways you feel that they're friends. 
the more interaction the main character and the opponent have with each other, the more interested we become in that relationship. A great example would be the original Star Wars trilogy. In the first movie, Luke never really interacts with Darth Vader. In that one, it's the Obi-Wan-Darth Vader relationship that's interesting, especially that final fight when they meet, and there's this sort of respect between them, even though they're enemies. In the second one, things really get interesting when Luke finally meets Darth, and they have that amazing lightsaber battle, and then Luke discovers Darth is his father. And this all culminates in Jedi, in one of the best examples of an action sequence just being packed with emotional importance. Their final battle in the Emperor's Chamber. Darth is trying to convince Luke to turn to the dark side, and he's using all these emotional triggers to get him to use his hate and to turn to the dark side to defeat Darth Vader. So he pulls out the ultimate ace, which is mentioning his sister. And then Luke goes nuts and uses his emotions to cut off Darth's hand and is just on the verge of killing his father when his inner struggle, this inner battle, finally comes to a peaceful moment and he realizes what he has to do, which is not strike down his father. He's become a Jedi and he's on the verge of redeeming his father. So that scene works on two levels. First, the visuals are amazing. Any lightsaber battle is worth watching. So the action is great, but without that emotional struggle that's going on between Darth and Luke, the scene would lose all of its power. You could just replace the characters with any random two people, and it would be a cool-looking lightsaber fight. What makes it memorable and powerful is the relationship between these two and what's going on beneath the surface. So here we have this moment when everyone enters the secret alien chamber with all the skeletons and the one missing the head. Does anyone else feel that this happened way too easily? All they did was make it down the stairs, walk through the treasure room, and Indy had to just hold up the skull to the door and it opened up. No booby traps, no challenging opponents, it's just literally a walk in the park. And there are no stakes, there's no tension, there's no ticking clock. Arena and the Russians are behind them because we know that these homing devices are being left by Mac. But so what? So they're going to show up and try to take the skull again and do exactly what with it. That's a major problem of this film. We're at the climax and we still don't know what putting the skull on the skeleton is going to do. And we don't know exactly how Arena wants to harness this power within it. And here Mac pulls the gun on Indiana and everybody and reveals that he's still working with the Russians even though his motivation for leaving them and pretending to be a double agent makes no sense because he couldn't have known that Arena was going to lose the skull earlier, but we'll accept it. Arena shows up, and it's really interesting here how her character reacts to all these aliens. It's almost like she's having this religious experience. This is her faith, and this is her coming face to face with her god. Here, Arena starts revealing some of the knowledge she has regarding what the secret is about these aliens. It would have been nice if this would have been revealed a little bit earlier so we could build up the expectations in our minds and feel a certain level of restlessness of wanting to get to this climax so we could finally see if the reality is just as impressive as what we imagined. And here Arena's talking about how she can't wait to find out what these aliens can tell her. And Indy responds by saying he can't imagine, the people who built this temple can't imagine, so she shouldn't be trying to find out what this power exactly is. Then she responds to him by saying that he needs to have faith, which is actually a callback to Raiders of the Lost Ark, when Indy really didn't believe in any kind of religious mumbo-jumbo. When talking about the Ark, he mentioned that it had supposedly the power of God, and then he added, if you believe in that sort of stuff. So at the beginning of Raiders, he wasn't someone who had a lot of faith, but by the end of it, he does. So there was an opportunity here with that comment from Arena to venture into Indy's character and explore that. But it's too late in the movie to bring that up. It would have been a great source of antagonism between this main character and his opponent. And here's another confusing moment during this climax. Indy interprets Ox's babble and reveals that the alien wants to give them a present, something big, something important. Arena's really excited because she thinks it's going to reveal the secrets of the universe to her. As soon as Indy finishes translating, he just walks away and automatically assumes something bad's going to happen. Now he's right, something bad does happen, but we never know why. Why is this alien malicious? Why did it kill Arena? Why didn't it just sit down and have a conversation with him? Why didn't it reveal some of these secrets? Why didn't the legend come true that when you have the skull, you get this great power? 
none of this final action is really motivated. Obviously, the alien is an intelligent being, so it had some kind of reason for doing what it did. It would have been really nice if we would have gotten just a little bit of a hint of what that reasoning was. Maybe it's as simple as Arena's heart wasn't pure, she was evil. But then on the other hand, Indy is obviously pure-hearted. Or he's not perfect, but he's a pretty good guy. So how come the alien couldn't sense that, since he already formed a connection with Indy when Indy looked into the skull's eyes earlier? Why couldn't Indy have been told some secret, some form of knowledge? Later, Indiana's going to say that the alien's secret was knowledge, but we never got to know any of it. We never had any of it revealed. It would have been nice if Indy would have gotten just a little bit of a taste and shared it with us. But apparently that would have involved a scene of more talking. And for some reason, this movie doesn't want a lot of talking. It, it just wants a hyper-fast pace. So that's why we get action sequence after action sequence with minimal moments of character reflection, of these window character moments, or these reality confession cam moments. And as a result, we don't really know how anybody feels about anything, and we never really learn any kind of mythology about these aliens, and what's ultimately at stake. And this final scene loses any possible powerful impact that it might have. The only thing that we feel is the visual bedazzlement. It definitely looks amazing. There's no denying that the special effects here are groundbreaking and imaginative and creative and really make you just say, wow, I haven't seen that before on a big screen. But unfortunately, at the same time, you're thinking, I haven't seen it on a big screen, but I don't really know what any of it means. Here's a final insight into Arena's character, as she's the only one who's not afraid. She's kind of in this religious-type trance, just enamored with the power of this being and she's pleading to know what it knows. Again, it would have been nice if this aspect of her personality was a little more developed and shared with the audience. Aside from more window character and confession cam moments for her, she could have been spilling her soul to Indy when she's in scenes with him and they're battling each other for knowledge and to find out the secret of the skull and where Akbar is. Or you could have had another Russian agent, her superior, someone who didn't believe in the occult and the psychic ESP kind of powers as much as she did. Probably more of a military person who just didn't really believe what she believed and felt she was kind of kooky, but at the same time hoped that it was real enough to be used for Soviet weaponry. And here Indy, Mac, Marion, and Mutt run away, and Mac gets caught up in his greed and tries to grab a last-minute treasure. And moments like this are always funny, where here Mac has fallen down and just the gravity and the force of the alien ship is pulling him back. So Indy throws him his whip and he grabs it and Indy's only a few feet away and he's not feeling any of the gravitational forces but Mac is floating in the air. You always wonder in those moments like how come the other character isn't being affected by that? But whatever. Mac flies off then Indy, Mary, and Mutt Knox have to run out of the temple. Meanwhile, Arena is getting laser-eyed by the alien all these mental fumes of knowledge are getting sucked into her brain through her eyes, and she's starting to evaporate. So the alien kills her for some reason. Again, we don't know why. The alien just turned out to be some pissed off dude. It would have been great if there was a little more motivation behind that. You could have possibly connected it and explained it through Indiana Jones and Ox, who have both looked into the skull and have kind of some telepathic link with the alien. It would have been nice if those characters would have told us why the alien decided to kill someone and maybe even why they decided to leave. One missed opportunity possibly is the use of the American FBI agents who interrogate Indy after the nuke the fridge scene. It would have been great if the American government or military had an interest in this adventure and they sent those two guys to follow Indy and keep track just in case this legend turned out to be true and he actually found something. Because here the Russians are the ones portrayed as kind of kooky because they're trying to develop these ESP weapons. But maybe there's a branch of the government, like some black ops branch, that's also developing it. So they follow them here, along with the Russians, want to use their knowledge and their powers for, for a little bit of evil. So it decides to leave. And you could have had 
arena superiors, some Russian military bigwigs showing up, and, and then on the other side you could have had the American military bigwigs showing up. So everyone comes together in this temple, and you kind of realize that even though both sides are fighting against each other, there is a shared level of corruption, and not the noblest of intentions. And the alien decides to leave because neither of the superpowers of Earth at that time are wise enough to handle the knowledge that they have. Then Indy and company run out of the temple, and their last final booby trap they have to get past are these stone wheels spinning at the stairs, destroying them. And it makes me wonder, as this temple's being designed, obviously here with the help of aliens, but these ancient peoples are building it. And it's always funny, I wonder about this sort of primitive boardroom conversation they had about the design of this place, saying, well, if anyone makes it to the UFO, and they somehow escape the wrath of the flaming eyes, let's just make this final booby trap where... Everyone has to run past the stairs, and these wheels are going to destroy the stairs, but they're going to move slow enough that anyone can get past them. It's purely just a genre set piece. It's only for the visual tantalization of the audience. And speaking of tantalizing the audience, here's the greatest moment in the movie, when they run to the top and they have this overview of what exactly is going on with the temple and the alien ship. The alien ship basically destroys the temple, rises up, and then vanishes into another dimension. All the rocks drop, and then the water spills in. And as Ox says, it's a broom to their footprint. Any proof that they were here is buried under the water. And while the visuals are wholly awesome, it still leaves you feeling a little bit empty. One element that could have been added here is a little social commentary. For lack of a better word, a little bit of a message. Again, here Indiana Jones responds to Mutt's comment about the City of Gold by saying that their treasure wasn't gold, it was knowledge. It's really strange that that's mentioned here at the end because throughout the movie it's never really addressed. You get the feeling like there was this idea of an overlying message to the movie, but it really didn't have any time to be developed because for some reason the decision was made that this movie would just move at 100 miles an hour and never stop to address the characters and their emotions as I've mentioned a hundred times before already, but on the other side, never address this overview of what the world's becoming at that time and what it needs, which is a little bit of enlightenment. Even though the world's in the middle of the atomic age and scientific knowledge is really developing, human wisdom isn't developing at the same speed. America had the Red Scare in the 50s, where everyone was a communist suspect. It was basically a modern-day Spanish Inquisition, but instead of agents of the church interrogating people, it was agents of the government. It was a time of fear and paranoia. It's possible that when Ox and Indy looked into the crystal skull, the alien was able to read their minds or capture the history of humanity that was in their memories, and it determined that humans aren't ready to grasp the knowledge that they have to offer. After all, it's easy to transfer knowledge, but it's almost impossible to give wisdom. Wisdom comes from experience, and the human race is still very young, so it's possible they decided that they'd return in a certain amount of years when humans have grown up and gained some experience. And this could have been part of Indiana Jones's growth in the movie. Again, as has been mentioned, maybe he knows he's getting older, he doesn't have a lot of adventuring left in him, and he wants to go on one final adventure that's really going to give something to humanity. His whole life he's just been going after these physical treasures that either end up in museums or boxed up at Area 51. And it's perfect how this one starts at Area 51, where one of his greatest adventures ended, where the Ark was put in a box and hidden somewhere. Here, maybe he knows a little bit more about the legend of Akbar, about the Crystal Skull, and he knows there's some hidden knowledge related to the aliens in the skull. Or maybe he doesn't believe it at the beginning, but at the middle of the move, as soon as he looks into the skull, he realizes what's at stake. And now he's invested even more because he wants humanity to grow faster and to go further. He was just a victim at the beginning of the movie of the paranoia and mistrust by the government agents. So why wouldn't he be motivated to give humanity a little more wisdom to take them to the next level of evolution by following through with this adventure and gaining the knowledge from these wise alien beings? So it's acknowledged here by Indy at the end, but only as an afterthought. The next scene is the finale, where Indy and Marion get married. As mentioned before, this could have been set up a little bit stronger earlier with Indy wondering about his future. He's getting older, his father died, he doesn't have a family, what is he going to do? So Marion coming into his life along with Mutt 
is kind of a perfect solution to that inner battle that's going on. Unfortunately, it wasn't really addressed in the movie, and it just kind of comes here at the end as an, oh, well, let's just have him get married. And this ties into Marion's character. She's not really developed as a person here. All she does is argue with him for one scene, and then the rest of the time, just smile at him, and then do crazy things like drive a car off of a ledge onto a tree and into the water. Every character should be just as developed as the main character. So for Marion, she should have some kind of issues going on within her. Maybe she doesn't have a husband, and she's always loved Indy, and she knows, obviously, that this is a child, so she wants to get back together with him. Maybe also there could have been this interesting little twist earlier where she's a really big believer in the UFO, in the aliens. After all, she's been hanging out with Oxley, and he's a believer in the Crystal Skull and Akabar. So maybe... With the 1947 Roswell, she became interested in that, and hearing all the stories, she's a true believer. So in this adventure, she could really be pushing Indiana Jones forward to believe and to challenge this inner struggle that's going on regarding settling down. And then this would be the culmination of that. And there was also a missed opportunity with Marion's character, because the ending of Raiders is very similar to the ending of Crystal Skull here where the objective is this mysterious, powerful object. In Raiders, it has more of a religious significance, and it has the force of God. Here, Arena, a Soviet and a communist, a regime that was known for suppressing religion and erasing the notion that the power of Christianity and of God exists, she might believe that aliens are the gods. And here we have this being coming to life and basically killing her the same way that the Ark killed the Nazi, where it's just this light, this powerful force, and it just evaporates her. So there's a great opportunity here for Marion to call back to Raiders, where her and Indiana are basically in the same situation, and she could totally make a joke about that, saying, how come every time we go out, we always get into these situations? Or maybe she could say something like, why is it you can't ever take me out on a normal date? Just acknowledging the fact that in Raiders they were together and tied up and about to witness some kind of powerful energy coming from this artifact and here they are again just about to get vaporized so she might be the one to tell indy and everyone to get out of there because she knows what's coming and then there's mutt williams his character is also ignored in terms of a journey of a character arc he really doesn't have one and that's the reason when we leave the theater here we feel like we had a great adventure but we're a little bit empty because no one in the movie was changed by the adventure and as a result We didn't connect with anyone, and we weren't changed. If any character in the movie should have changed, Mutt Williams is that character. We can compare him to Luke in Star Wars. He's the one that needs a call to adventure so he can fully realize some kind of destiny, especially here in the last scene at the wedding when the doors open and they blow the hat off the stand onto the ground and Mutt picks it up. It's an obvious sign of, hey, this guy could be the next Indiana Jones, and then Indy comes and takes it away from him. But for me... He hasn't shown any kind of potential to become anything close to Indiana Jones. Let's give Mutt Williams a little bit of a character examination. Right now, think of a couple adjectives that describe him at the beginning of the movie, or when he's first introduced. Now, at the end here, think of some adjectives that describe him in this moment. He's pretty much the same. He really hasn't changed at all. The only thing that's happened is he's found out who his dad is, he doesn't have his motorcycle, and he's not pulling his switchblade out all the time. But in terms of the inner growth, there's nothing that we experience through him that tells us he's become someone new or someone different or someone who's realized their potential. He's a static character. Everyone here is a static character. The journey, the adventure did not affect anybody. And as a result, we haven't been effective. And this movie just feels like some impersonal ride on a bus we took with some strangers instead of a cross-country trip we take with friends and family which is what it should have been. And that all starts with the screenwriting. The screenplay is the blueprint of the movie. It's not the end of the creative process, but you need a solid beginning to get everyone going. Film by nature is a collaborative process. You need the director, cinematographer, actors. You need a lot of talented people to make this blueprint into a reality. It's just like building a house. No matter how skilled the bricklayers and the carpenters are, if the blueprint for the house is off in any kind of way, the house will be built on a slant or it'll crumble after a little while. When crafting a screenplay and designing a movie, there's really three major areas that need to be addressed. Genre, story, and character. And in the late 70s and early 80s, 
there were three filmmakers who were masters in each of these areas, and in 1981, they came together and united their collective skills to create a classic, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The filmmakers were George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Lawrence Kasdan. Lucas is an undisputed master of story. His imagination is unparalleled, and he's the one that comes up with the great ideas for the, for the overall concept of a story, of a movie. He creates the worlds, the universe, the inhabitants, thinks of the characters, and helps develop them. And it was during a conversation with Steven Spielberg that the idea for Indiana Jones was born. As the story goes, Spielberg wanted to do a James Bond type of a movie, and Lucas said, I have a James Bond type story, but it's even better. In 1980, Spielberg was the most popular director on the planet, the man with the golden cinematic touch. And that was related to his uncanny ability to deliver genre. The success of Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind proved that he had undeniable filmmaking talent when it came to delivering genre. In Jaws, it was making us scared of the water by putting the camera to the point of view of a shark moving up underwater towards someone's feet. Or as someone's attacked by a shark, keeping the camera above water and following them as they're jerked back and forth allowing the audience to create the sense of terror by imagining what's going on underneath. Delivering these genre moments in Jaws made a whole generation of would-be swimmers afraid to go into the water. In 1980, Lawrence Kasdan had written Empire Strikes Back. Empire is arguably the best of all the Star Wars movies, mainly because it takes the characters to places you wouldn't expect in a sci-fi movie. The characters are complex, and their relationships are filled with emotional struggles you'd expect in a straight-up drama. Essentially, Empire is treated seriously. The characters are given a level of respect by the filmmakers, and therefore that transfers over to the audience. Good storytelling is basically drama, the struggle between characters. Ideally, any genre movie is basically drama plus that genre, so a sci-fi film or horror or a western should have a solid dramatic base that just happens to take place in this genre setting. This is what Empire Strikes Back does perfectly. It respects the drama and takes that into an amazingly imaginative world of this science fiction universe. So it was George Lucas that created this unique universe, it was Steven Spielberg that delivered the genre set pieces, and it was Lawrence Kasdan that finally tuned the dramatic moments between the characters. And this implies creating complex characters, figuring out who each person is, what they want, what their struggles are. This is a lot of work, and it's something that Kazdan is extremely talented at. And the evidence speaks for itself in Empire and Raiders of the Lost Ark. 27 years later, two out of these three pieces are present for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but it doesn't feel the same. Because that skilled person who can develop the characters and create these emotional struggles is gone. A lot has been said about the writing of the script for Crystal Skull, how it moved from one writer to the other, how M. Night Shyamalan had a draft going, and then Frank Darabont had a draft going, and many different writers took passes at it. The end result speaks for itself. This blueprint created a movie which has two of the three major areas of any cinematic story working well, but missing a key element. The overall story idea is fine. The genre set pieces are amazing, but here, the characterization fails. And it might just be a sign of the times. In the late 70s and early 80s, there was a level of respect for all the elements of a good movie, especially characterization. In 1981, when Raiders came out, there wasn't this big Hollywood blockbuster machine ruling over everything. Blockbusters had pretty much been invented in the mid-70s with Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and Star Wars. More than likely, if there was a blockbuster, it had the name Spielberg or Lucas attached somewhere to it. So the hyper-greed propelled by the corporate-owned studios of today's age hadn't infected the filmmakers of that era. Obviously, the studios wanted to make as much money as possible from every project that they released, but the assembly line process of would-be blockbusters wasn't so scientific as it is today. The best way to put this would be, 30 years ago, it was story, ideas, and characters first, then profit. Today, it's the reverse. This is one of the most obvious aspects of the Crystal Skull. In a lot of ways, this movie was created because there's a huge market for Indiana Jones. It's been almost 20 years since the last big screen adventure, 
and there was a multi-generational demand to see Indy back on the big screen. This movie could have been about Indiana Jones in an old folks home, changing the TV channel with his whip and looking for a lost bedpan, and it still would have grossed $500 million worldwide. Obviously, everyone involved wants to make the best movie possible. No one's trying to take shortcuts or just put something together really quick just to make some money. There are some big names attached to this project, and these names have a level of quality associated with them. So obviously, they want to keep that reputation going. But here, it looks like the creators of the blockbuster have unknowingly become victims of it. That's a troubling sign for the future of cinema when two of its masters fall victim to superficial storytelling. These pioneers revolutionized movie making in the 70s and 80s. By dreaming big, they forced the medium to evolve. They gave us visuals that inspired our imaginations and characters that touched our hearts and the technology and tools to transfer our fantasies to the big screen. But somewhere along the way, between Raiders and Crystal Skull, the movie world forgot these three key elements, genre, story, and character. Character was the first to go, followed by a weakened sense of story, and both of those were replaced with a cracked-out form of genre. In today's movie world, it just seems all you need to deliver is the genre. Give us spaceships, explosions... High-octane chases. Keep our eyes and minds stimulated with amazing visuals, and we won't notice that our hearts are aching for some kind of connection. And that's the real reason we all go to the movies. To connect. To get in touch with our basic human selves. And the quickest way to do that is to feel. And no other storytelling medium can connect us to our feelings faster than the cinema. Stories remind us of who we were, they tell us who we are, and they inspire us to dream of what we can become. Humans have used story in this way for thousands of years. Back then, the audience gathered around a campfire as the storyteller weaved a tale. And staring into the flickering fire, the spectators imagined the story in their minds. Times really haven't changed all that much. The flames of imagination are now projected on a 70-foot screen as the tribe gathers around to listen and watch a story. Only this time, they have air conditioning. Regardless of the time, place, culture, and language, we all look to find ourselves in the stories that we watch. That means we look for characters we can connect to. Crystal Skull reunited us with one of our most beloved movie characters. However, while it put us in the same room as him, it failed to create a real connection. One final note to mention here is the music of John Williams. When you think about the memorable scores he's composed, you have to just sit back in total awe. If Spielberg and Lucas were the storytellers for an entire generation's childhood, then John Williams is that generation's composer. Think of your top five favorite movies from the last ten years. Now try to hum the theme songs from those movies. Not as easy as it seems. Out of my top five, I can only remember two, Lord of the Rings and Spider-Man. Even though I love The Matrix, I can't really remember the theme song from it. Same thing with X-Men, but now that I think about it, I can remember Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. The point is that it's not easy to create a memorable score. And John Williams seems to be the golden goose of movie composers. He's just laying golden eggs left and right. And he deserves a lot of credit for taking already great movies and bringing them to a whole nother level. Imagine Jaws, Superman, Star Wars, and Indiana Jones without his music. It's pretty much impossible to do so, and if you took the music out, the experience would not be the same. Whether it's the Imperial March announcing the entrance of Darth Vader, the foreboding underwater base of Jaws approaching, or the joyous trumpeting of the Indiana Jones theme. His music connects us to and reflects the emotions of the main characters. That's why listening to his score during this film might be the best indication of how the movie failed to connect the audience with the characters. Watch The Crystal Skull again, but this time pay very close attention to when the music cues occur and to what emotions and what characters they're responding to. After a while, you'll start to realize that they're just being put in there. They're not hanging on any of the emotions of any of the characters because the characters aren't being engaged on that level with each other. 
So while it's great to hear this music in the theater with THX sound, it doesn't send the tingles up the spine or create the goosebumps that it normally does. But regardless of that opinion, John Williams deserves a big thank you for scoring the cinematic dreams of an entire generation of children. I know the credits have been over for about 10 minutes now, so thanks for hanging out a little bit longer and listening to some final thoughts. Thanks for actually listening to the whole commentary. I hope it was entertaining and informative. And we'll hang out again at the next movie night. Until then, choose your movies wisely, and as always, long live good movies. Copyright 2000.